You're here. Uh, we want to just stand up, raise up, raise your hands this morning, lift your voices, lift your hearts for the love of the Father. We want to encourage all of you to sing loud this morning. up your voices and lift up your praise. Join with the heavens declaring the wonders of his faithfulness forever. Sing of the victory, the hope of the world. The Savior has risen, the Spirit has come to bring us into his love. The people of God with the freedom of hope in our hearts, how great is the love of the Father. Lifted from darkness and into the light, the sons and the daughters are loved at a price. Our God has made us his. people of God. What a grand title for us to have as believers in Jesus Christ, that we are owned by God and we are loved by God and he makes us his children. So we are his people. And uh, I'm so glad that you've come to share this time with us of worship here at the church. I know that some of you are still at, online at home and watching the service. God bless you being there. But for the rest of us, I'm just glad that you've come out and joined us here today as we worship this God who's made us his People. Let's bow, let's ask him to bless our time together and let him show us things that we would not know except that he reveals us to those things to us even today. So let's bow in prayer. Father, we want you to open our eyes to the truth of your good news for us again today. And Father, for many of us, we live within the reality of knowing that we are your kids, that we are your children, we are your sons and daughters. But Father, just drive that truth home again into our hearts so that we know the depth of love that you have for us and we understand the great hope that's waiting for us someday when we go to from this place to that place where we'll spend eternity with you. Father, again, thank you for being who you are, for giving your spirit to us, sending your son for us. And Father, we just pray that what we offer to you this morning in worship will be pleasing on your heart and pleasing in your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue praising God.
Who am I that the highest King would welcome me? I was lost, but He brought me in. Oh, His love for me. Oh, His love for me. Who the sun sets free. chosen. We are highly favored. We are sons and daughters of the King Most High, and we are deeply, deeply loved by our Heavenly Father. And our Heavenly Father wants us to extend that same love to those around us. And so we think of the times that we can share Jesus with us, and we want others to see Jesus in us through His love, that they might come to know Him as their personal Savior. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
exalt you this morning and we praise you for who you are and we thank you that the love that you have bestowed upon us, the extravagant love, you've asked us to share that, to share that love to those around us, those that we don't even feel like it. But God, you have shown that that love needs to be built into our lives day by day, that they will see Jesus in us and that they will want what we have. We pray these things in your son's holy name. Amen. Please be seated. The first century Christians faced many of the same challenges. So, John wrote them a last letter. This was a letter of hope that John could testify to. A reminder that no matter how dark it gets, Jesus is our advocate. Make plans this fall to take your faith to a new level. Well, welcome to the sixth of our series, which means it's the last one in this series that we're looking at. We've entitled it The Last Letters that I Put on the Grandpa John because I've told you every week I love the idea that he's a grandpa and his name is Grandpa John. And it's all, but, but basically, we know he's a grandpa. At least he's the age of a grandpa. We don't know if he ever had kids. There's nothing that tells us he was married or had kids, but we know that he was of an age. And we know that when it came to the church, that he loved the church as his children. And he used that little phrase a number of times throughout his letter, my dear little children, or my dear children. Because here was a guy who loved the people that he served, and he wanted to share with them like a grandpa wants to share the good news that he has with his own grandchildren. Here's John wanting to do that for this church. It's been an amazing study that we've been in. And this is an important letter because what we know is that the believers here in this church, I mean, we're talking about the, the second and third generation. So there's been a time when John hasn't been around them. He was in Patmos for a number of years, uh, you know, in that penal colony there. And he hasn't been around the church. He hasn't seen church members for a number of years. And now he's back. And he's seeing that there's new people in the church. And, and now some of the people that were the first generation believers, they've passed on. And now it's the second generation and the third generation of believers. And he's brought a letter. He would have brought this letter from Jesus that he received in Patmos, that G, where Jesus has one church that he identified there. He identified seven churches in the book of Revelation that he sends a letter to. The first one was to the church at Ephesus. <clears throat> and it was that church that he says, I know your works, I know your deeds. I know how, you know, you've been faithful, but I have this against you, that you don't have that love you once had towards me. Well, John's bringing that note, and he sees the people, and he realizes, you know, you have some place to move. You need to move back to the love. And so he comes, and he talks all about this passionate love that they need to have for the Lord as well. And so really, in John's heart, he's coming as a grandpa wanting to tell the people, get back to living out of the love that God had for you and have that love back for him like, you're, like you think your parents might have had or your grandparents might have had when this church was first started. Well, that's what John's doing in this letter. He's calling them back to having a passion for the Lord that they had left and they had lost. And the reason that sometimes that happens, we know the reason that happens, Outside pressures become so, you know, powerful against us that the love of, of our lives for others grows cold. The Bible talks about that in the last day, that the love of many will grow cold just because of what's happening in the world around us. And it's probably happening in that church in Ephesus as well. But the other thing that was moving them away from having that deep love for one another was the, the idea that false teaching had come into the church, where people weren't seeing the, the Jesus who he really was. And they had an understanding of Jesus was not the real Jesus. They didn't see him as God come in the flesh. They didn't see him as fully God and fully man. And, and that was having an influence in the church as well. And so there were people who in the church were kind of leading people astray and getting them not to believe the truth of, of Jesus and not getting them to help understand the, who Jesus really is. But so John's here and he's trying to kind of counteract that. And the things that he wanted to them to understand when it came to, you know, who are the real believers in the church? 
If you want to know, am I a genuine believer or am I kind of falling into this pathway of not really knowing Jesus and, and, and serving a Jesus who's not the real Jesus? I mean, John says there's things that we can look at in our lives that will tell us if we are genuine believers because there are people who just simply claim to know God and simply claim to know Christ and they really don't. But John says there are observable marks that will differentiate a true believer from a, a false deceiver. A gen, tr, uh, d distinguish between those who really know God and those who only claim to know God. And, and we've looked at that over the last few weeks. Observable marks like, do they walk in the light? I mean, are you walking in the light as God is in the light? That's the mark to you that if, you, if you're walking in the light, you're a true believer. Are, are, are you uh, living in fellowship with other believers? Do you have a fellowship with God and are you living in fellowship with other believers? That, that harmony that you have with others in the, in the church and in the faith indicate that you're a true believer. Do you walk in obedience to God's word? Do you hear it? Do you, do you abide by it? Do you follow it? Do you obey it? I mean, if you are the kind of person who says, this is God's word, I'm going to do what it says. I mean, that's a real observation that you can have about your own life that you're a true believer. Are you growing in holiness? That's an important thing for John as well. Are you loving the other believers just like God loves us? Is that love now infiltrated into your life so that when you look at others, you see them as people to love like God loved you and Christ loved you. And so John calls us to be observing ourselves and how well do we love others in the church? Well, there's another observation that we saw last night or last week that gave proof about the genuineness of their faith. And what John said to us last week was the fact that we can see that if we remain in the faith, if we remain in the church, that we really are true believers. Because he said, you know, the false ones, the ones who are like the Antichrist that one day will come into the world, see, they don't remain. They, were, they, they left from us, John says, because they were never really a part of us. They didn't really belong to us. And so they left us that... And that became the indication that they never real, really belonging to us. And so those who of us who are really believers in Christ, there is a power in us that we will remain until the end. We will remain faithful to the, to the word of God and to the, the, the faith that we hold to to the very end. And, and it's really not upon us, was it? I mean, if you remember, John's not saying it's because we have the strength in us that makes it happen. He says, no, there's an anointing that's been put on our lives. And it's the anointing that comes from God the Father. And it's that anointing that will cause us to remain in the faith. And the anointing that we talked about last week is that it's the Holy Spirit that does us. He's the anointed one. He's the one who's the anointing on our lives. And he was the one who guides us into all truth and guarantees that we will have an inheritance waiting for us when the day is over for this life and we go on to the next. He's given us the guarantee of eternal life. Now... This is the hope that we have, isn't it? Now, I'm going to talk about, we're going to talk about hope this morning. And this is the hope that we have as believers, that we know that if we remain in him, that there's a wonderful inheritance waiting for us through Jesus Christ. That's the hope that we have. We hope that one day, if we remain in Christ, we will become like Christ fully, and that Christ will put all the blessings of, of God upon our lives. We're going to look at how John describes that. So John chapter 2, verses 28 through chapter 3, verse 3 is the passage that I'm going to look at this morning. Now, as I told you, this is the last of the series. I'm not going to take you all the way to the end of John's uh, letter, though. We're not going to talk about chapter 5 or chapter 4 or most of chapter 3. I mean, we just don't have time to do that because I wanted to highlight some of these important ideas that were at the beginning. And uh, I'll leave it up to you as you, you know, continue reading through this book to take the time to really hear what John's saying because there's some tremendous things that he still has to share with the people in his day and in our day as well. But here's what we're going to look at today, starting in verse 28. Let me just read the passage and we'll talk about it. And now, dear children, there he uses that word again. Remember, dear children comes up seven, about seven or eight times in this letter. And so it's a, revealing the heart of John. He calls them his dear children or dear little children sometimes. And now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. 
I mean, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. And the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are God's children, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is, and everyone who has this hope purifies himself just as he is pure. It's a great passage. Now, Grandpa John is talking about, he's talking about the blessed hope that we have in Jesus. And, and it's an interesting word, the word hope. Uh, in the Greek, it's the word elpis. And uh, it, it's the idea that <clears throat> not only do we have a hope that Jesus will one day return, but, it, but it's this idea. It's a hope that we can have a confident expectation that he will return with pleasure. It's the idea of a, of a confidence and assurance that includes that what we receive is going to be pleasurable. So it's not just a hope that something's coming and we're not looking forward to it, but it's a hope that something's coming. We have a hope that something's going to happen, that the Lord is coming back, our blessed hope. And the hope is that it causes us to think about that event with great pleasure in our heart, great joy set before us. There's going to be more pleasure than we can ever experience. That's the hope that he wants us to understand, that it's a hope, this great assurance that brings with it great pleasure to our lives. So I want to talk about that today. Now, now. When we talk about hope, the Bible talks a lot about hope. From the day you were saved, you were given a hope, weren't you? And the hope was put within you. And the hope that was put within you is that no matter what hardships you go through, no matter what difficulties you face, no matter what trials you have to endure, no matter what problems you have to put up with, I mean, there's something coming in your future that is so good that it causes you to have, find pleasure in looking forward to it. And that hope that we have is the fact that Jesus Christ is going to return and bring us to his, his eternal home. That's the hope that we have. That's the hope of the church. It's the hope that we live by. It's a hope that we give our, of our lives to. That's the hope <clears throat> that we have. The hope that puts great joy in us that Jesus is coming back uh, for us to take us to be with him. And of course, you know, when that day happens, when he comes back, we don't know the day or the hour, do, do we? I mean, the Bible tells us, in fact, Jesus says that don't be looking for the day or the hour. You can know the season, but the day or the hour, you're no, not going to know. And so what you need to do is just be prepared. Always be ready that because the day might be this day. And so we need to be ready for that day when it happens. In fact, Paul is talking to the believers in, in uh, Thessalonians, a Thessalonica, I should say, and, and he knows that they're a little concerned and a little fearful that, uh, that when Christ comes back, some of the other believers in the church have already died and they're going to miss out. That, that they're missing out on the hope that they could have had, but because they, but because they died, that hope doesn't apply to them. So they're worried about that. And Paul says, don't be worried about that. In fact, here's how he says, we don't want you to be ignorant about those who have fallen asleep. Or to grieve like the rest of men who do not have hope. I mean, people who died sometimes lost hope. But Paul says, don't grieve like other men do who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, God will bring with them those who are asleep in Christ. In other words, what he's saying is that it doesn't matter if you're alive or dead. When Christ comes, we're all going to have the hope. It's, that hope is offered to all of us. And so you and I are people of hope. And the fact of the matter is, you know, when it comes to hope, there should be no point in your life where you say, this is hopeless. There's no hope at all. Hope is lost. Hope is gone. I mean, we should never have that because our hope is always in the fact that Jesus Christ is coming back. Our hope is guaranteed to us by God. See, you know... I, I've, I've done, conducted a lot of funerals over the years that I've pastored. And many of them, and most of them, I should say, are from people who are right from our church. 
And, and as I did those and knew that the, the, those who were, had uh, died, uh, the believers, the, the strength of their faith, all of them, I had this feeling, I'm going to see that person again. I'm going to see that person again someday. And I knew that it was just a, a, a pause in the connection that I had with that person. But I'll have to tell you, I've done some funerals that I didn't know if the person was a believer or not. And, and you know what? Here's what I thought in those services. I wonder if I'll ever see that person again. I wonder if I'll ever meet that person again. See, I never thought that about a believer, though. I never worried about that when it came to those who died in the faith who were believers. The confidence is that we will see them again. Why? Because, because Jesus Christ is alive. And it was the resurrection of the Christ. And then we know that there was an empty tomb. And we know that, that uh, the disciples and the others who were living in that, that time of Christ's resurrection saw Jesus Christ walk 40 days on earth. And he ate with them, and he talked to them, and he shared with them, and he encouraged them, and he reminded them of the truth that they had learned, and he gave them some new truth. And all that was happening in those 40 days as Jesus was around. And then what did he do? He took them up onto the, to the top of a hillside, and he said to them, you know, I'm going away to the Father. And, and, and then as he was taken up to the Father, an angel made that statement to all those who are present, the same Jesus that you saw just taken up to heaven is the same Jesus who one day will return in the same manner. John was there that day. John heard that. John witnessed that. He witnessed that Jesus going up and he heard the angel promise that promise that this Jesus, your hope is that this Jesus is coming back. And so we're the people of hope. And in the passage that we're looking at today, we're, we're, I want to see five things that have to do with this hope that we have. Five things that keep this hope alive. A strong hope that we can have in Christ. Five things John tells us about this hope and how we can keep this hope alive in us. Here's the first thing. Our hope, when it comes to hope, our hope, I'm going to say it like this. Our hope is fostered by abiding in Christ. Our hope is fostered by us abiding in Christ. In other words, abiding in Christ produces a confident hope and takes away this, this feeling that, you know what, we might be ashamed before God on judgment day, that he won't want anything to do with us. Look how it says it in this verse. He says, and now, dear children, continue in him, okay, so that when he appears, we might be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Okay, now, I like this, how it says continue in him, and, and that's how it says it in the NIV, but if you would go to the, the new King James Version, it wouldn't use the word continue, it would use the word abide in him, and so abide in him, and that's, and when I, really, for John, that's one of the key things that he wants us to understand, because when, it, when he'll talk about abiding, He'll use that term 24 times in this short little letter. He'll talk 24 times. He'll use the idea that we abide in him and to remain abiding in him. And so this is an important topic for John, that we understand that we are the ones who will continue in him to abide with him. I mean, that's what abide means. It means to remain. We talked about that last week, to remain in him, to remain with him, to abide in him, to abide with him. But it actually has even a better understanding. Because when it talks about us continuing with him, to continue in him, it's the idea of us being with him at the point where we're at home with Christ, just as Christ is at home with us. That's the picture that I want you to get. That, that the connection that we have, this continuing on, is because we re remain in him or we abide in him or at home with him as he's at home with us. And our hope and prayer is that because we're at home with us, that we look forward to his coming, right? That we're so at home with him that we look forward to the coming because it will just bring us more into that household of God. We'll feel it even more. So there's this anticipation of his return because we know that there's even more to get when we're abiding with him. 
we have a hope to come. It's not like, and it's not like this, you know, I'm looking for Christ to come, but I sure hope he comes on a Sunday morning when I'm in church, okay? I mean, that's not the hope we have. The hope is, Lord, today or tomorrow or the next day, whenever is the time, I'm ready, I'm waiting. I'm, I'm looking for, I know you, I'm abiding with you. Come, Jesus Christ, come. That's the confidence, and that's the fact that it says that we appears that we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. You know, the flip side of that, think of the flip side of that. Well, one of the ways, or one of the translations is that we will shrink back so that we will not shrink back, or that we will not be ashamed, or that we will not be embarrassed at his coming. Can you imagine him coming and, and we want to hide from him? Can you imagine us being so out of connection with him that now he comes and we're thinking, oh, I don't want him to see me like this? I mean, you know, if, if, I, came, if I came to your house tomorrow morning unexpectedly, I just showed up. I'm going to do a pastoral visit at 6.30 in the morning. And you hear the doorbell ring and you come and you look out the window. 6.30 in the morning, you look out the window and there's my face in the window. You, think, you would think, what is he doing here at 6.30 in the morning? I mean, the first thing you would probably do is, that, I'm not dressed for this right away. And you'd probably want to go and change clothes as quickly as possible. But you'd, if, if you did open the door to me and I came in, for a pastoral visit, the first thought you'd probably have is, doesn't he know he should call ahead? Right? Doesn't he know he should announce his coming rather than just to show up? See, and the reason you feel that way is because I don't abide with you in your house. When I come into your house, it's like, here's a stranger coming. You know who I am, but it's a strange place for me to be is in your house. And so you'd feel a little bit embarrassed maybe by what I would see or the uh, clothes that you're wearing. And you'd shrink back. You maybe would not even want to open the door. You would shrink back. I mean, that, for you, the hope is, if I hope the pastor comes and visits me, but I hope he does it when I am ready for him to come. But that's not the case when Scripture, is it? Jesus will come when we're not that ready. But those who abide with him are always ready. You know, tomorrow morning, if I came to work at 6 in the morning and realized I had to go back home and pick something up at 6.30 in the morning, and I walk through the front door and there's Sandy in her bathrobe, she's not going to say to me, what are you thinking of coming when I'm in my bathrobe? Why didn't you call ahead? She's not going to say that. Because we abide with each other. We're, we're at home with each other. And, and that's all that John is trying to say here. I mean, when our abiding in Christ fosters a hope that whenever Jesus comes back, we're ready. And we're, we're anticipating his arrival whenever it comes. And so the, the, the first thing that John wants us to know is that our hope is fostered if we have a heart that we want to abide with Christ and we allow Christ to abide with us, if that's the, the life that we have with him. It's fostered by abiding in Christ. It takes away any embarrassment, takes away any shrinking back, takes away any shame that we might have because he's at home with us and we're at home with him. That's the first thing John wants us to know. Here's the other feature that has to do with hope. Our hope is realized by righteousness. Our hope is realized by righteousness. And what do I mean by that? Well, look at the verse. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is what? Is born of him. See, now the word righteousness really means this, that which is acceptable to the moral standard that has been established. Think of it like that. That which is acceptable, that which is acceptable to the moral standard 
to what has been established. What do I mean? Everything that God does is acceptable. Everything that Jesus does is acceptable. Okay? They're all acceptable. Why? Because everything they do is in line with the moral standard that God has established. And so their, all their actions are righteous because they're always doing, every action is, is in line with the standard that God has established of what determines a moral quality of a person's life. God does that. And so, as I said, when it comes to God's moral standards, you'll never see God is good you know, 99.9% of the time, and every so often he'll do something bad. That never happens. He'll be right 99% of the time, but every so often he'll do something wrong. He'll be, you know, honest 99% of the time, but every so often he'll give a little white lie. That is never true for God. God is acceptable because his standard, he's always living up to the standard that he has established. And so if you and I are going to have that standard as our lives, that we're going to be considered acceptable because we follow his moral standard, all it's saying here is that those who are righteous, those who live by that standard, that tells us that we're born of God. That's all that John's saying. That's the indication because we're willing to follow his standard for our life, to put ourselves under his standard, that that's an indication that we are born of him. And that means that our, that our hope now, when he arrives, is that we're not afraid because we know that we've been living a righteous life by his standard. I mean, this is what John's trying to communicate to us. Now, the whole idea is, is that the practice of our life should be more and more in line with the life of Jesus Christ all the time. And, and here's what I know. We're not always righteous every, every day. I mean, there's things that we do that is wrong. But let's talk about the progression of righteousness in our lives. Because the Bible talks about that as well. It's because we're becoming more holy. That we're going from one level of holiness to another level of holiness to another level of holiness or from one level of glory to another level of glory to another level of glory. And so there's a progressive righteousness in our lives that we're becoming more and more like the righteous Lord who, who is our Lord. There's a third feature. So that's the second feature. The second feature that it is, our hope is realized by knowing that we're people of righteousness. We realize our own righteousness is in Christ. Here's the third thing. Our hope is established by his marvelous love. This is really important. Our hope is not established by our love for him, but our hope is established by his love for us. And here's how John puts it. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. How great. How great. It's an interesting word in the Greek, <clears throat> used five times in the New Testament, different, different places, uh, but has the same idea, that it's something that's so, so out of this world that you, you notice that it shouldn't be of this world. It's so unique it's so different, it's so unordinary that it's really not of this world, okay? So we find it used, here's a place where it's used. A woman comes to Jesus, terrible sinner, a life of prostitution, and she comes and what does she do to Jesus? Her tears are used to wash his feet. Her hair is used to dry those tears. And the anointment, the ointment that she has, she pours on him. She anoints it with this precious oil. And the Pharisees watch that and they say, don't you know the manner of life this person has Why would you allow her to do this to you? But what they were talking about is that her actions are out of character with her life and who she is. What manner of action is she doing that would cause her to be acceptable to you. That's what they're saying. 
And they're really questioning Jesus, and why would you let her do that? If you knew the manner of woman that she is, if you know her life is like, you would never have allowed her to do that to you. How can you not see the manner of her life? Another time it's used is with, when Jesus is with the disciples on the storm, and they're afraid for their lives in the storm, and they come to Jesus and they wake him up. And Jesus then calms the storm. Remember how that happened? And, and, and he gets up and he says, peace, be still. And the wind stops and the waves cease and it goes to calm. And the disciples look at one another and the response is, what manner of man is this? That the waves will listen to him. And, there, and it means that what they're seeing is outside their comprehension of what should be taking place or what is typical in our world. And so here's John, he takes that word and he applies it to the love of God, doesn't he? What manner of love is this? What manner of love is this that the Father in heaven has lavished upon us that we should be called children of God and, and he makes us his children and so we are. He's made us to be his children. I mean, you think about this love that they had and, and you think about the, 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 the lavished upon us. It's the word. It pictures the, the pouring, how, what manner of love that God has lavished his love. It's, it's, it's the excessiveness of what he's done that creates some of that same kind of sense. What, what, where is this happening? How could this be happening? That he would lavish on us his love. I mean, the love that is so great that what does David say about that love as he so talks about it in, in Psalm 103? He says, the Lord is compassionate and be gracious. He's slow to anger and what? A little bit of love? No, it says he's abounding in love. This is God. He's abounding in love. Even to the point where, where David will go on to say in just the next couple of verses, for high, as high as the heaven is above the earth. I mean, how high is that? I mean, we don't know. We haven't found the ceiling of this universe yet, have we? We don't know how high it is. But, but David is saying, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those of us who fear him. It's an amazing thing. And so our future hope is established by his marvelous love. It's all about him. There's a fourth feature, and let's not forget the fourth feature. Not only is hope fostered by abiding in Christ, not only is hope realized by practicing God's righteousness in our lives, not only is hope established by the marvelous love of God for us, but our hope is also nurtured by knowing that God will bring to completion what he started in our lives. Our hope is nurtured by the fact that we're not the ones who really bring to completion, but God is the one who's going to make this thing happen. It's he's the one who's going to bring, bring it to completion. Dear friends, he says, now that we are children of God and what we, have, what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him for he shall be, we shall see him as he is. I mean, this is such a great promise for us to understand because the day will come will be everything that God wants us to be. Now, John is realistic enough to know that we can't even know what that means in this life right now. We don't know what that means. And that's why he says... Uh, you know, what we will be has not yet been made known, okay? We don't see anything. We get, it hasn't been completely made known. We might get in, in glimpses of it. People might have images of it. People might have opinions about it. But, you know, the fact around it is that what really will happen to us on that day that we set our hope on when Christ returns that we'll be like him is that we don't really know what we will be like. But we know that we'll be like him, and that's pretty good. In fact, Paul will go on to say to the believers in Ephesus, I mean in Philippi, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly wait a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that, that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will like his glorious bodies. And so I don't know what will happen on day. I, I don't know how it will happen. I just know that this, that we will be like him someday. And he will transform the bodies that we have so that they'll be like his glorious body. And that's going to happen through his power. That's the hope that we have. And finally, there's one more 
facet to this hope. Our hope is maintained by just holy living, isn't it? I mean, our hope is maintained because we're living holy lives before him. John calls it the life of purity. He says it like this, everyone who has this hope in him, if you have this hope in him, here's what happens. You purify yourselves. We purify ourselves just as he is pure. I mean, that's understandable, right? It's not like we're going to live any way we want in this life thinking that I, I'm just going to, I know Christ will purify me someday when he comes and I can just say, no, no, that's not how it works. There's this understanding that Christ is making me pure. I'm going to live by that purity. I'm going to make sure that my life is not a mixture of good and evil, of truth and falsehood, of right and wrong. I'm going to make sure that my life is pure, just like his life is pure, so that there's no evidence in me that I am not living like he called me to live. That's the hope that we have. And so let me wrap this up. Here's, here's Pastor John, or here's Grandpa John. And again, he's talking to people that he wants to, to know that, that they can have a hope that will remain. And he says, here's how you can know that that's the kind of hope that you have. That you can have confidence that you will abide in him. And that you can have confidence that you can remain righteous in him and be purified by him and come to know that you'll have a home with him someday in heaven. That's the hope that he wants us to understand. I mean, it's a great thing, isn't it? I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid that Jesus might come back today or tomorrow or the next day. There's no shrinking back on that day because when we really are abiding with him, the day he returns is not soon enough. And so we say, Lord, come. I'm ready. Fulfill the hope that I have in being changed into the image of your son when I see him face to face. What a great hope. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you again for the blessings that you give to us in this world, but the greatest blessing is going to come in the world to come. And Father, we don't, we don't have it yet, and we don't even know what it's going to be like completely. But we know it's going to be glorious. And we know that that's where we are to have our hope in. So, so if we fail in this world, and so if we find you know, disaster in this world, so if we find pain and, and, and pressures in this world, Father, keep us ever reminding ourselves that it's the next world that our hope is in. When you come back and when we see you face to face, give us a strong hope as we uh, go through this life, looking forward to seeing you someday face to face. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We got a song to close with. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now. And in the waiting, the same God who's never late, He's working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now and in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out you're working all things
John for reminding us of the hope we have in Christ. We know the end of the story. Take a seat and we've got a few announcements. First of all, I want to call up Scott Stump. Thank you, Pastor Brian. As many of you are aware, October is Pastor Appreciation Month. And boy, does this church have a lot to be grateful for. Um, do we have any pastors in here who yeah, come on up. They did this at the 8 o'clock, and, and they got cards and, and uh, gift at the 8 o'clock, but I want to recognize them again here real quickly. We, as a, on behalf of the LT and the staff here in the congregation, we just want to say thank you, because the uh, Lord has truly blessed us with shepherds who love the Lord, um, preach his word, and embrace evangelism. And uh, we are just so blessed to have a fantastic team of pastors here. Can we give them a hand? And would you all, I'd just like to uh, pray a quick blessing over them. Will you all just extend your hand real quick, please? Heavenly Father, we just pray a blessing. You have truly blessed our church with great leaders. We pray that you continue um, to just shower us with that grace um, to bring forth pastors who love you, love your word. And we pray that you keep them safe and healthy and just in love with your, your son and with you. We ask this through your son, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you. And thank you. I can say on behalf of the, the pastors as well as our whole staff, we love serving with you. So thank you for that. A couple more announcements. First of all, men's breakfast this Saturday from 8.30 to 10 o'clock. Uh, men haven't been together for a while, so come out this Saturday, 10.30 or 8.30 to 10 o'clock. You can sign up online uh, through the church website. Also, next week, we're starting an adult Sunday school class in the gym. The name of it is called a Bibble 
Biblical perspective on mental health. If you have ever wondered well, how does scripture relate with psychotherapy and all those different kinds of things, come to that class, find out about what the biblical perspective is on mental health. Next Sunday in the gym is when it starts. Also, October 31st on Halloween, we're having our fall festival. The fall festival is something we've normally had indoors, but it's going to be outside in our parking lot, rain or shine, from 2 to 4 o'clock. Bring the kids, get some candy, get some uh, popcorn, all kinds of different things that they'll be doing there, enjoy some games. And also, there's going to be a food truck there, so come and enjoy the food trucks that you haven't been able to have all season uh, for most of us. We want to thank you for coming. I just want to just encourage you to go in the peace that we have in the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're dismissed.